went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, sorry, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you belong to Christ, will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. Kind of hard to be cheery when it ends with uh, some uh, amputations and weird things like that. So, good morning. It's great to see everyone again. We are marching through the book of Mark. Um, we started it around January, and uh, now we're, uh, again, we're, we're, we're reaching towards the, the final third uh, of the book. And so if you haven't been here, um, just recently we, we've been learning about the, the, an important moment where Jesus was transfigured. And then when, this is all the things that are happening kind of shortly after uh, Jesus revealed who he was, and so the big question, um, really it's a great question for Northern Virginians, is, is who doesn't want to be great? <laughs> That's kind of what we're looking at today. There's things, you know, you know you're part of the Northern Virginia culture when people ask you where you're from and you don't say Virginia, you say Northern Virginia, or the Washington DC, or you want to, you're kind of an exclusive, you want to be part of that excuse, exclusive club. Uh, you know, we like to think of ourselves as great as Thomas Jefferson High School, it's always ranked as the number one or two high school in the nation every year. And we're, even though uh, you don't have any kids, or none of your kids went there, you're still like, we have Thomas Jefferson in <laughs> Northern Virginia. Um, I think three out of the top five uh, counties uh, for medium income are, are located in the, the D.C. area. Just recently I saw that our con congressional district, the people who live here have the, the longest lifespan of anywhere else in the country. Um, you're like, that's kind of weird. And so we have all these yeah. reasons to brag. And uh, we, we own this, and this, this is us, this is, who doesn't want to be great? Um, but really, what we're looking at today is Jesus, this whole passage, you'll see, this whole prick if you were looking at, Jesus is addressing, um, he's really addressing that one question. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask now that you would take it and make it yours. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would reveal your word to our hearts, and that we may leave this place changed because you've done that. We hope and ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So really, we're, we're talking about motivation. Motivation is kind of a funny, it's a funny thing. You, depending on, on what's motivating you can cause you to not do something or to do something. Uh, I'll give taxes as an example. If you know you're getting a refund, you know, come January 1st, you're calling the, the paycheck people, can you send me my W-2? I gotta send that sucker in. If you know you're probably gonna owe money, you might be thinking, We'll just wait and push that off a little bit. If any of you have doctor's appointments coming up where you know they have to do a particular type of exam that you're not looking forward to, 
you might forget to set that appointment um, every every couple months, and the nurse keeps calling you, say, I'll, I'll make that appointment later, I just forgot, and you keep pushing it off. And really, um, the gospel message, part of the gospel message, remember the gospel message is it's vast yet simple. Um, but really, I think the part of the gospel message that, that we're really addressing today is that it, if you want to follow the gospel, the, the message of Christ, that means you're going to have to live for a different reason. <clears throat> or to put it this way, put it differently, what you want at the end will truly change the way you get there. What you vision at the end of the journey will really dictate and change how you want to get there, what your end destination is. And the gospel says if, if you want the end destination to be eternity, then it's going to have to irrevocably, undeniably, unquestionably change the way you live. And that's where we're diving into right now. So just remember the point. Peter, James, and John had just been with Jesus as he was transfigured, and they got to see him for more of his glorious self, who he truly is. And they came down after the transfiguration to an event where the disciples were trying to cast out a demon and couldn't do it. And Jesus basically talked to them about it, it, you're, you're trusting in your own ability and you forgot this is about me. It's about faith. It's not about you. That's why you couldn't do this. You, you were doing a spiritual thing and forgot it was spiritual. That was, that was last week's message. And now we're moving on from that. Right as that event ended, Jesus for the second time now in, in the Gospel of Mark has revealed to him his ultimate plan. J.C. Ryle, uh, from, again, a century or so ago, said this is, this is great. Jesus is revealing why he came. He, he, he didn't come to be your buddy. He came to die. So this is where we pick up. They went from there and passed through Galilee and did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now again, so what's setting the tone for the rest of this is Jesus is saying, the reason I've come, the reason I've come is to die. And we see the disciples, having just come from a place of, of being rebuked kind of for, for trying to do things of their own strength, hear Jesus say that, and they're like, I don't have a clue what that means. <laughs> so let's talk about something else. I'm afraid to ask. And it turns out as we see the next passage, we find out what they decide to start talking about on their journey. So Jesus just reveals that he's going he's gonna to be delivered or he's going to die. And they start talking about, well, who's going to be the greatest? What? That's exactly where we find them. So now, again, uh, and as they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you guys discussing on the way? They kept silent. From the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, now, who was the greatest? This was in, 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 in Jewish um, theology and understanding. I mean, your position and standing before God was, was always something they were kind of worried about. Because remember, they, they, the, the, the system they had reminded them constantly that there was a distance between them and God. That had to, something had to be done about that. And they knew these sacrifices that were being done weren't perfectly getting it done. And so how close you could be to God. Remember, the whole temple worship was about how close you can get. Right? Gentiles were here. Then, then, then women could come here. And then the men could come here. And then the priests could come here. And then, then the high priests could come here. So everything, you know, your, your whole spiritual life, really, you understood how, how close you got to be. And Jesus himself talked about, at times, the least and the greatest. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a completely random conversation, but in the context, it's kind of weird. Because Jesus has said, I'm, I'm going to die. They say, well, let's talk about who's the greatest then. <laughs> talk about a slight, uh, a slight disconnect. But one of the first takeaways you're seeing this here is if someone were to ask you, what was the point of Jesus? And you said it was to live a, a good life. And I would encourage you to see what Jesus himself said about the reason why he came. And as he came to die. Pretty heavy. 
But a lot of times we like to insert words into Jesus' mouth. He, he didn't come to make you a better person. He didn't come to be your best friend. Um, I've met people who say they, they, they've had a bad relationship and they say, I'm just going to date Jesus for a while. And I say, whatever he came for, he did not come to date you. <laughs> and we have a lot of reasons. And, and it's unfortunate because let the man speak for himself. I came to die. And obviously they question the problem. Why would you, why would you have to die? Right? That's what he's saying he, he came to do. And the disciples said, I don't even want to think about that. Because in their mind, remember, in their mind, they're still thinking he's come to establish some type of a, an earthly kingdom. And you can't establish an earthly kingdom if your king is dead, right? So they're thinking, I don't want to, I, wait, 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 wait. If he's dead, we don't get our, we don't, we don't get the castle, right? We don't get a fortified city, so I don't want to think about it. That's why they were afraid. I don't want to think about what he means by that, so let's just pretend he didn't say it. How often do we kind of do that at times, right? Come to an interesting, difficult passage. You're like, I'd rather just not think about that for a second and go on to something more important, like who's the greatest? And that's where we find them. And this is what we find. It's interesting that Jesus, um, Jesus' response is amazing here because he, they're in a house. He, he obviously he knew what they were talking about. I mean, so he brings up a child in front of him, and, they grab, and then it's kind of it's very sweet actually. He takes the child in his arms and so listen. He says he sat down. And called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone will be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Isn't that amazing? Now this passage, what we're looking here, it's also, you can find it in uh, Matthew 18, 1 through 10. If you're taking notes, you can also find it in uh, John chapter 9, um, uh, 32 through 32 through 50, actually. 42 through 50. And you see this is an important enough event. Again, the, the gospel writers want to talk about this interaction. Um, this interaction with this child. And again, what, the, the, what Jesus is, is, again, talking about here, they're talking about who's the greatest. And he brings in, in front of all of them, the least, a child, right? Physically the least, mentally the least. He said, this, here's the least. How you, how you embrace and love this child, the reflection of how you embrace Christ, and how you embrace Christ is, in, in essence, we're fair, embracing the Father. So he says, let's talk about Who's being great? He says, one time ago, who's the greatest? Who's loving the least? Now, what's interesting is, the disciples, or not interesting as we've been seeing through Mark, they immediately don't get it. <laughs> they immediately, remember, they're, they're coming from a place where Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus transfigured. They're coming down. They, they, they couldn't quite... Because you might think this next part is kind of a random part, this part about this guy who was healing in Jesus' name, and the disciples were like, we told him we couldn't do it, right? So what we're about to see is that, that you can see the conversation kind of happening. They, Peter, James, and John saw something fantastic. They came down. The disciples were kind of got rebuked a little bit for, for trying to do things out of their own strength, uh, trying to do things in their own name. And, and they, they have a little bit about, you can see the conversation about who's the greatest. They, they, they think because... They're in this special group of people around Jesus that they're more special than the people around them. The whole, almost the entire Holy Old Testament is a road sign of the people of God doing that every time. They weren't special because they were special. What made them special is God chose to love them. God didn't love them because they were special, right? Does that make sense? Do you follow me? God, God did it. It's like the the Washington Redskins, right? They're special because I love them. They are not special. The disciples were making the same mistake. Again, the same mistake. So much so, let's read the passage again, because you read this and think, why? Why is this here? And it makes sense in the whole context. And it says, John said to them, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. See that? What? 
So like, hey, this guy was doing what we couldn't do, and we put a stop to it, right? Because he wasn't, he wasn't approved by us. The disciples, the apostles, he wasn't talking about Jesus. He was saying he's not one of us. And Jesus says, don't stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. He's saying, listen, we might not have appointed him exactly as one of you, but he heard, he believed, and he's doing it. Trust me, something's happening there. Spirit's moving there. And then he says, for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So you're, and they're immediately told about, so Jesus just says, listen, how you love the least reflects who the greatest is. And they go, we got it, we got it. But here's the guy we shouldn't be loving. He's doing things without our permission. And you can see why that conversation makes sense because John, and this, he's speaking remember, on behalf of the disciples. He's kind of pointing out, okay, these, these, this, this is something that's not appropriate. He shouldn't be allowed to do this. And Jesus is saying, it's all the same. They were trying to say, well, who, who, who shouldn't we be doing this with? They're, that's their immediate defense. Maybe there was a little guilt there. I don't know. But they're like saying, well, they were trying to, you could tell they were trying to draw a line of, where, of who the greatest is. And they, clearly, they thought they were slightly greater than this guy. So much of it telling them no. One commentator points out that if for, for other denominations, as in denominations in general, all, all churches, denominations that follow Christ, here's the warning of considering your denomination better than them. Right? Jesus is saying, if they're doing the work in my name, what are you doing? Why are you... You know, we might have different theological points, different styles of worship or leadership or governance, but this is probably the preeminent verse and why you'll never ever hear me disparage another pastor or church just because there's different... Why I don't get in arguments with Baptists or Presbyterians or Episcopalians. Um, if they're loving the Lord, then, then that's enough for me. Almost every other issue uh, is something we can talk about. There are very few things I will argue about theologically. And those are the things that determine whether or not you're a Christian. Got it? And so for some of us, especially in the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, um, we're kind of known as, as, as brow readers at times. Um, and here's a great example of Jesus' heart towards others who are advancing the kingdom. And it's still in the context of who is the greatest. Jesus just basically said, you're not greater than that guy. He really didn't even have official kind of a authority authority, but you're not, you're not, you're not even in a place to tell him he can't do that. What are you doing? And then we go to the next level. Again, the, the disciples... What they're just not doing, um, they're just missing the point. They're just not, they're just not connecting the dots. We see it again and again. They're hearing two sets of information and just not putting them together. Um, I had a moment like that, embarrassing moment, where I did that once. I had two friends that I, I got to know kind of independently of each other. I, we were all kind of a bigger group, but I didn't really know they knew each other. And so I knew this guy had a I was dating a woman by um, uh, name Jen, and I knew this girl was dating, you know, a guy by the name of Scott. And it never, in my mind, connected that those were the same people. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was closer friends with the guy, and uh, he, he was sharing that they had. To, this was a few years ago. So he had to break up. He had to break up. It was devastating. Um, but he had, he had to break up with her because it just wasn't the right fit. And there was a wedding that I needed to go to. This, this, is, this, is like, this is about 20 years ago. There was a wedding I needed to go to. I didn't have a car. So the, the Jen was said, I'll, I'll drive you to the wedding. And so we're driving to the car. And, you know, something to talk about. I was like, can you believe Scott had to break up with that girl? <laughs> and, uh, and she's driving. And she goes, mm -hmm. And she's kind of like, that's weird. She stopped talking. And it's like months later, um, her brother is like, hey, Chris, remember that time you were talking to her in the car? Scott, that was that was the boyfriend. I'm like, yeah. She's like, no, 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 that Scott and that Jen. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I'm looking back. I was like, how did I miss that? Right? In the same way, Jesus 
revealing himself, his de declarative statements on who he is, why he's here, what his purpose is here, what your purpose is here. They're just not making it, they're not connecting it. We get it, and there's so much so that when Jesus says, I gotta die, they're like, well, we're not gonna ask? I don't wanna know about that. They're, they're <coughs> refusing to think about that stuff. And Jesus gets even more intense here. Again, if, if you're you, for so many people who struggle with Christianity, if it's you or friends who do, so much of the struggle with Christianity um, is around bad ideas about the point of Jesus, why he came, right? So passages like we're about to read now are confusing, and people will just want to step back a little bit because it doesn't make sense if Jesus just wants to be your butt. It says, whoever causes one of these little ones of mine to believe in me to sin, um, and the, the word to sin there, the, the verb actually is, um, it's the same kind of word as um, uh, sinister. It's a kind of a sinister thing. Uh, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Wow. Right? First, just for any of you who want to know why children's ministry uh, is really important here, this is what's hanging over our necks. Um, the idea of how important these little ones are. Parents, Think about this. But he's saying, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, better for him to be great millstone or hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. For the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Now this is the same passage, Matthew um, 5, 29 and 30, Jesus 20, 29, 30. Jesus is in this Sermon on the Mount, he talks about this the same, it's the same thing he's talking about here. This in passage here, I come here to point out, there is a, uh, this, this the, the word here for hell, it's this the Gehenna place, it's, it was like the rubbish, trash heap burning pile for Jerusalem. And that's what he's, he's equating um, when he's talking about heaven and hell. So what does he say? Well, first, it's important to note, he's, he's being metaphorically speaking here. But what is he metaphorically saying? What is he trying to say? What does he communicate the utmost importance? Where is he going with this? There's a guy um, whose name was, uh, uh, it's Japanese, so I'm sure not pronouncing it correctly, but Hiro or Hiro uh, Anando. I know he just died uh, just about a year ago. He was the soldier who, um, he was um, trained in guerrilla warfare. His actually family came from a line of samurai. Uh, and he enlisted into the, um, the Empire of Japan, this is in World War II. And he was sent to the Philippines to conduct uh, reconnaissance and guerrilla warfare. Um, was sent into the jungle and told him, you are not to commit suicide and you are never to surrender. And so he did it. 1975, he was still in the jungle. 29 years after the end of World War II, he was still following his orders. They knew he was in there, they would drop leaflets, and he said he saw the leaflets and thought people were lying. They had to go find his, um, the, the officer who was above him, who was now in his, you know, 70s, and fly him to the Philippines and send him up into the mountains of the Philippines to tell the guy officially, you're released from your orders, you can come out. For 30 years, almost 30 years, he was living guerrilla warfare in a place where there was no more war. Why? Well, the emperor was, was believed to be, the emperor of Japan at the time was believed to be a descendant of the sun gods. And so the emperor approved the war. And so when he was given orders, he obeyed. He was willing to sacrifice 30 years of his life on a mountainside and, and hiding for those orders. Because he believed they were coming from the divine on some level. Imagine what missed 
place. Hope. Misplaced trust can do to somebody. We talked to her in the beginning, I said about motivation. He was motivated to follow forever. Living just a couple other guys actually, but down alone in the mountainside. In the same way here, where Jesus is speaking metaphorically, he's saying, if the gospel is so great, if the gospel is so great, what are you willing to cut aside to follow it? And he uses graphic imagery to paint the picture. And if you're, you're supposed to be caught up, if your attitude is, I wouldn't do that, then that's supposed to reveal to you then, then you don't think it's that great. You're not that excited for it. But if your response was in your heart, this is what I want, then you're understanding what it means to truly be great. And then we get to this uh, business here. No commentator knows exactly what it means. It's a very random verse. For everyone will be salted with fire. Either he's, it's a, he's talking about everyone this is a verse on judgment for every other one living then, everyone who's going to die. Um, there, there are two passages. There's one in uh, Leviticus 2.13. There's another one um, in Ezekiel chapter 42, uh, 34, that, uh, 43, 24, that talks about, so there was salt um, and fire were parts of uh, pur purification process mm -hmm. and, and offering or purity. And so maybe he's combining the two, but the salt of the fire Jesus is combining them, and it's never been used. And so either he's talking about everyone will face judgment, or that the believers will be salted through fire. In persecution, you will be salted. Salt is, in this instance, talking about purification. We're supposed to be people who are adding and bringing life and preserving life because of the gospel. So he's saying this, this salt, this salt is going to, you're going to become salt, but it's going to happen through fire. And then he ends with this. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how do you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. So what is he, what is he saying there? The beginning, the question really was, the same question the disciples are asking, do you want to be great? For those of us who know Christ, it's a trick, kind of a trick question. If we really want to be first in the kingdom in heaven, then our goal on this earth is to make Christ the greatest. Does that make sense? It's not about you. He's saying, his journey, go all the way back to the beginning, we talked about he was going to be die, he was going to die and raise again. He was talking about the crucifixion. To be the greatest is to embrace who he is and what he's going to do. And extend that out to everyone. The greatest is the one who is going to make themselves the least and make Christ the most. That's what it means to not lose your salt. He's even saying at the end there, being at peace with everyone, he's saying, the way you do this is by loving others because of the gospel. The mark, the marks of what it looks like, the marks of the kingdom, the marks of the gospel, we're using this context talking about who's the greatest, the marks is humility and repentance. What does it look like? It looks like humility. Christ humbled himself. As we humble ourselves, Christ is exalted. And as we repent, as we return from ourselves and turn to him, Christ is exalted. Is your gospel marked by humility and repentance? Every other religion, every other world philosophy, 
offer some form of being nice to other people. But none of that actually ever deals with your soul. This isn't saying just love your neighbor. This is saying love Christ. Love Christ, and because of that, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor by making Christ great. So, do you want to be great? And the answer is humility, repentance. The solution is to make Christ the greatest in your life. Is he? Look at your life. Is it marked by the willingness to abandon everything for the sake of the gospel? Because that's what he's calling us to. Why? Because it is so great. Remember I said, if what the end of your life is wonderful, you're willing to change your course to obtain it. If the goal of your life is to end happy and wealthy, then you will live your life with yourself at the center. But if the goal of the end of your life is to see Christ exalted at the highest place, then that will change the way you live and act every day. All to his glory. All because of him. Please pray with me. Lord God, the secret to being the greatest in heaven is for you to be the greatest in heaven, for you to be the greatest in our hearts. It is a work impossible for us to obtain. It is something only accomplished by you humbling us and helping us to repent. So Lord, may that flow down into our hearts. May we make you the greatest. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray.